Greetings to everyone and welcome to the guest lecture series 2020, an initiative by Technovanza VGTI. This is Udvi Ranjan and I am thrilled to be your host for today. VGTI was established in the year 1887 and is upholding its proud legacy of over a century filled with brilliance and educational prowess. Furthermore, it has thrived in nurturing the brightest minds of the society. Technovanza has always been the prime platform where the flame of expertise has been meritoriously passed on to light more torches. Pioneers of diverse fields including Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, Mr. Ratan Tata, Gaur Gopal Das, Mr. Avtar Seni and many others have graced Technovanza with their presence while progressively illuminating young minds to new areas of interest. Behold, because today we are elated to add a truly inspirational name to our glorious list of dignitaries. Our guest today is not only a brilliant innovator, but also an entrepreneur and venture capitalist. Today, we are pleased to welcome the phenomenal Mr. Vinod Dham. Popularly acclaimed worldwide as the father of Pentium for leading Intel's iconic microprocessor from its inception to the worldwide success, Mr. Vinod Dham has over 40 years of experience in developing semiconductor products and technology. During his 16 years at Intel in the 80s and 90s, he successfully led and managed the Intel 386 compaction, i486 and the Pentium processor families, helping Intel become the largest company in the semiconductor industry. After his successes at Intel, Mr. Dham led two early stage startups, first NextGen as its COO and then Silicon Spice as its CEO. He was instrumental in their highly successful acquisitions by AMD and Broadcom. Subsequently, Mr. Dham used his startup skills and successes to bring venture capital and startup ecosystem to India. He, he was amongst the handful of pioneers who helped set up India's startup ecosystem during the first decade of the 21st century. Currently, Mr. Dham is mentoring startup entrepreneurs as an angel investor. Mr. Dham has received numerous recognitions over his lifetime. He was named one of the top 25 executives in the computer industry for his contributions to the success of the Pentium processor. Previously, he has been highlighted as one of the 100 most influential Asian Americans. Recently, Mr. Dham was exhibited amongst the Indian Americans who have helped shape America at the storied Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Mr. Dham has a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics engineering from Delhi College of Engineering, now Delhi Technological University, and has a master's degree in solid state science from the University of Cincinnati, Ohio. We will be having a purely interactive session with Sir today. Greetings, sir. We are honored to have you here with us. Thank you very much, Rami. Appreciate that. So, uh, starting off with the questions, starting off with the most important one. So, you are known as the father of the Pentium chip. So, can you tell us about the work you have done on the Pentium chip, your inspiration for it, and the challenges you faced during its development? Okay, fine. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, in order to answer this question, I think I'll give you a little brief history how, how I ended up leading the development of Pentium chip. As most of you probably know, the first IBM PC that was launched in August of 1981 was based on Intel's first generation microprocessor that was named 8088-8086, just two versions of it, an 8-bit and a 16-bit. The third generation Intel processor, 8386, was introduced four years later in October 1985, uh, and it was launched by Compaq. Uh, it was the first 32-bit architecture and became the basis for the fourth and the fifth generation, namely the Intel 486 and the uh, Intel Pentium. Now, Compaq uh, led in using Intel 386, launched a PC clone industry. A Compaq lead in using the chip launched a PC clone industry that was later joined by Dell, HP, NEC, Acer, and others, making Intel realize that personal computer was going to become a very big industry in the future, and taking steps to become a single source supply of x86 processors, as we call them. Now, I had the distinct honor of working on all of these three generations in lead roles that made Intel an undisputed leader of microprocessors 
by garnering over 90% of the personal computer market during uh, its golden era, which I call from mid 80s till uh, the 90s. The 486 was introduced in April of 1989. Uh, it integrated the uh, math coprocessor 387 and the cache controller 385 into the 386 core. And basically, we speeded up both with technology and by bringing these things on chip substantially in order to make it a very significant uh, milestone. I was both uh, the person who uh, led the 486 to its tape out and uh, built the business around it as a general manager of the 486. And 486 was the chip that really put Intel over the top. It became the first mainstream processor that uh, went not only into businesses, but also began to find use in some of the homes. Right at the peak of the 486, when I was enjoying uh, my success and Intel was enjoying its success, Andy Grove, who was the CEO of Intel at that time, asked me to hand over the 486 uh, business over to one of my colleagues and asked me to step out to start developing uh, Intel's fifth generation processor that was initially codenamed P5 internally and was later branded as Pentium at the time of its launch. So I did exactly what my boss told me to do and, and, and started development of the Pentium uh, chip. Now, if you recall, by the time Pentium came on scene, I think the world at large had already figured out that uh, the personal computer is no longer a toy. It's going to uh, be going into every household in the world, and there'll be billions and billions of them sold as desktops, laptops, and handheld devices over a long period of time. Once that recognition came, companies as big as Digital Equipment Corporation, Sun Microsystem, some new alliances that were created between IBM, Apple, and Motorola, uh, the semiconductor companies like AMD and Cyrix, some new startups like NextGen and MIPS, some Japanese companies like Fujitsu and Europeans like SGS Thompson, they all basically waged a war to take a bite out of Intel's total dominance in PC business. So developing Pentium was not just developing Pentium, but it was really uh, fighting a war on so many fronts uh, that I could almost write a book separately, just discussing every day. Uh, in fact, I had a war room set up inside of our building where we used to all get together to see uh, the plan of war and strategize the war and see how the war is going so far in terms of the progress we were making. So my inspiration for Pentium development was simply to get there first because there were so many of them and we were afraid one of them, if he leaks in and gets ahead, the game will be over because in technology, as you know, you can't just sit on your laurels just because you had some great success in the past. You had to continue to build upon that success and stay ahead of the game. So the biggest challenge was to how do we stay ahead of the game and still maintain a very competitive performance because one lesser known thing, but maybe some of your computer science graduates may know, is during that era of Pentium, also these, some of these companies started uh, coming up with entirely new types of architecture called RISC that stood for Reduce Instruction Set Computing as opposed to, as opposed to CISC, which is a complex instruction set computing, which is what we were using at Intel. And the RISC clearly was much simpler processor with fewer transistors and was easier to build and actually performed very, very well. And we had a very significant challenge here to make sure our CISC, which has an overhead and legacy of a significant uh, amount of uh, chip that was dedicated to carry out compatibility of software from the previous generations of 8086, 8088 to 286, 386, and 486, uh, we had to carry that extra burden and still uh, win the race. So it's almost like we were running the race with one leg tied and everybody was running the race with uh, three legs. And this was really one of the biggest challenge I had was to make sure we still get ahead and uh, claim the high ground and don't let these people win. Now, as the history knows and you people know, we not only beat each and every one of them, but established Pentium and Intel as a household name and Pentium went on to become, like we said, an iconic chip and establish Intel on top of the world's largest semiconductor companies. 
Yes, sir. Like you said, this chip kickstarted the personal computing revolution. So it was great that you and your team could overcome these challenges. Yes, thank you. Um, and is the Moore's law still relevant for the semiconductor industry? And what breakthroughs do you see coming up in the microprocessor industry in the near future? Okay. Um, so since the future of Moore's law and the breakthroughs in microprocessor industry are intertwined. I will uh, like to answer these uh, two parts of this question uh, in, in different segments. So I'll first answer the Moore's Law relevance first uh, a, a, a today, and then I'd, I'll try to tie it into the immediate future of microprocessor and then long-term implications of Moore's Law in the computing industry. As you know, Moore's Law has been a guiding principle for semiconductor industry for more than 50 years. And I'm assuming most of the uh, engineers from VGIT know what Moore's Law is, so I'm not going to discussing that. But one of the uh, outcomes of the Moore's observation uh, was leading into decreasing the cost of computing and increasing the performance of computing over this 50-year period. Uh, in numbers, it means, for example, if you take memory chip as an example, today we can store 2 billion, B with a, a billion with a B, times more data in the chip, same chip as we could in 1965. So that's the level of progress that has been uh, taken place over more than five decades. Uh, in, in if, if you want to take another example of the cost reduction, uh, cost reduction would be analogous to, say, cost of a jetliner, which uh, if in 1965 cost $100 million, today should be costing $1. So it sounds funny, but that's the kind of cost reduction that came through this relentless uh, uh, marching on the Moore's Law that took place over the last 50 years in the semiconductor industry. I had the privilege of working with Gordon Moore and uh, actually not only just working with him but contributing uh, two of the data points on this famous exponential Moore's curve, which, you know, he had been plotting since 1965 and validating that whether his law has still been held uh, valid or not. And uh, one of them was Intel's 486 when I launched that, and the other one was Pentium. I remember sitting down with him and him pulling out his old 40-year-old uh, curve and then making an accurate point on the curve showing exactly the number of transistors and the timing of delivery of the chip to really see whether the curve was still holding up the exponential nature of growth or not. So while continuous scaling of transistors has delivered increasing performance over the decade, the resultant increase uh, in temperature over the last decade has already slowed down uh, the race for speed. So one of the things we are running into uh, is the, the physics. Uh, the physics is uh, reaching atomic levels. And uh, it's, even though we are able to scale the uh, size of the transistor in terms of the channel length, or the depth of source and drain, or the thickness of oxide, or a variety of other indicators. One thing that goes against all of this scaling in the wrong direction is the junction temperature. And the junction temperature does not scale with scaling. In fact, it goes up as we scale things down. And that has been the fundamental limiter in last decade of why we have stalled in continuing the, the Moore's law, and of course, Looking forward, as you go below 5 nanometer, uh, it's becoming harder and harder. And of course, people do talk about 3 and 1 nanometer dimensions, but I believe we have almost reached the, the end of the game here. And it's just a matter of time. Uh, we'll find out where actually the chips will fall, so to say. So the Moore's Law, in the way we have known, which was really scaling driven by a, a process node shrinks. You know, we used to call it... 10 nanometer and then 7 nanometer and 5 nanometer and now 3 nanometer. That type of scaling has come to a halt. Now, what are we going to do uh, for future um, a microprocessor performance? And I think what we are trying to do now is increasingly using multiple cores packaged together as chiplets and creating breakthroughs in innovation of high bandwidth chip-to-chip -chip interconnect technologies creating three-dimensional stacks so we can integrate the chips vertically upwards. So there are a lot of new packaging uh, methodologies and technologies and innovations that we are taking, that are taking place today to continue to spur the microprocessor industry in the near future. So that gives you 
both an idea about where the Moore's law uh, is ending and how it's really affecting the uh, the microprocessor industry as we have known it. Now, however, there is something new that's happening in the uh, computing world that is creating new types of microprocessor requirements that I want to touch base on for the next few minutes. As we know, with the advent of uh, smartphones and internet and billions of people all over the world uh, trying to connect to the uh, internet no matter where you are in the world, the computing has moved from your desktop and your laptop into what we call the cloud. So in this cloud computing, which has become the new frontier, and, and, and the big boys are like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, uh, people like NVIDIA, Intel, and some host of startups are beginning to create new types of chips. To These are specialized chips to accelerate the key machine learning algorithms for data analytics and artificial intelligence. The reason you need that is when billions of people are going into these servers which are sitting in the clouds of these companies and asking for all types of information and searching information, uh, one of the things uh, that is happening is it's generating huge amount of data. And in order to uh, leverage the data and create some intelligence out of the data so we can get benefit from that data, we have to analyze the data. In order to analyze the data, we have to create some machine learning algorithms and AI techniques to be able to go into the data and see what exactly it is trying to say so we can take advantage of it. So this particular type of need has uh, started a new field of what's called deep learning, uh, which is really a, a methodology for uh, you know, creating artificial intelligence, as most of you probably in computer science know. It's just a mindless uh, uh, multiplication of billions and billions of uh, matrices uh, and summing them over again and again across a neural network to gradually tweak and optimize it by trial and error. The microprocessor we use today were based on von Neumann architecture that was created, if I recall correctly, in 1945. And it's primarily serial in nature and is meant for general purpose computing. But the type of work that deep learning requires, the computing that deep learning requires, is parallel computing with massive speed uh, that's needed. And it requires very close location of the chip's memory to its uh, compute element uh, for reducing the data movement. So this itself has created a large market opportunity for new types of processor designed purpose-built for AI. And this is driving a new silicon renaissance here in Silicon Valley and all over the world. So there is now a new type of processor needed and this whole industry is being reborn and there's a lot of new excitement about creating these two new types of processors. Yeah. And the last one I will touch on is so what happens, uh, what lies beyond Moore's law? If Moore's law is finishing, uh, how are we going to continue to increase the performance of these computers? Because we still need very high-speed computers for a variety of applications uh, as we go into uh, genetics and DNA analysis and uh, weather forecasting and you know uh, climate change. All of these things require very, very powerful computers, and we don't have them if we don't continue to uh, increase the speed. So a couple of things that have been tried since the Moore's Law stalled, one of them was the use of graphene that does increase the performance by orders of magnitude, but the problem we ran into the last 15 years is to build practical circuits out of it because it just does not retain enough charge since it's much more conductor than a semiconductor is. I think one of the promising things that uh, the industry is right now undertaking where IBM and Google are taking lead, but there are uh, companies uh, such as uh, Intel, Microsoft, Amazon, Alibaba, Baidu, all of the, these companies have started working on what's called quantum computing. And in quantum computers, unlike in our computers where we have a, a bit to store the uh, charge, they have what they call a qubit. And the nice thing about qubit is that qubit is a state that can simultaneously store multiple bits and bytes. So now, therefore, you can really process a vast quantity of information uh, as compared to a silicon-based uh, 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 chip. So 
also since in qubit this spins uh, can be created uh, far more uh, than in a silicon bit which is single bit the capacity uh, increases exponentially as you connect these qubits together uh, i was personally surprised to know that a 300 qubit quantum computer uh, can perform more calculations at once than there are atoms in the entire observable universe. Just imagine that for a second. Just a 300 qubit quantum computer. Uh, by the way, most of them are only in double digits right now and not working as well as they should be, and I'll tell you why. The promise of quantum computing uh, is unfulfilled because the answers that come back from the calculations are not very accurate. And why are they not accurate? Because quantum computers function for very short, like microseconds or so. So your program has to execute in that very short period of time. Uh, otherwise, due to vibrations, temperature fluctuations, electromagnetic waves, and other interactions with surroundings, there is a phenomenon called decoherence that really uh, does not allow uh, these computers to calculate accurately. Now, a lot of people are trying to come up with error correction modes and things like that, but I think this particular technology is still several years and maybe more than a decade away for a, a commercial use in a serious manner. Those sound like very interesting prospects. Uh, there is a famous quote attributed to you that the best thing that happened to you was joining Intel and the best thing that happened to you was leaving Intel. So what did you mean by this cryptic line? Well, what I meant by this uh, uh, cryptic line was really uh, pretty straightforward. That is, you know, Intel, as you know, gave me the foundation to learn and build uh, its most iconic chips, uh, the Pentium 486 and 386. And this really was happening when Intel was going away from micro uh, uh, memory chips, which was really its mainstay when it was started and was being taken over by Japanese. And Intel was trying to discover what is it that they would do and be good at so they can have a sustainable long-term company. So this was a very difficult period for Intel and for all of us. And it, during this struggle uh, in the pioneering sense, uh, I was given a chance to work on some of the most important chips. Uh, you know, th this, this is really why I feel like uh, joining Intel was one of the best things that, that ever happened to me. Uh, joining Intel got me opportunities to work on these ships. Uh, it built my career and basically affected the rest of my life. However, leaving Intel at its peak of its game also gave me opportunities to experience the parallel world of startups and venture capital that I would have never experienced had I decided to stay with Intel. See, once you are a vice president inside a company like Intel, which is a large corporation, what you become is just an organization man. You simply manage whatever the company wants you to manage at any given point of time. So your growth is really more from being a loyal person and maintaining the business that you're being given to go run. Uh, it's more in maintaining things rather than creating and innovating. And I always wanted to really be working on things like Pentium 4680 all my life. So it was I found it very hard to reach a point where my... Uh, Talents were not going to be used in that sense, but were going to be used in a different way. So on the other hand, when I left Intel and went to, say, NextGen, which was my first startup, I learned how a startup works, what makes it unique, and how does one navigate the world of deal-making, because we sold that company to AMD, and I was quite uh, instrumental in that process. Then I uh, became part of Silicon Spice. I went through all the steps of how the money is raised, uh, and then how do you build a high-performance team around yourself? And what's the value of bringing in an early customer who can teach you how to build the chips that you need to build for the market? And then if you fail, how do you pivot the startup from the original idea uh, to make sure you still succeed with the great team that you have in place? So both of these experiences as an entrepreneur helped me raise... Uh, uh, the capital I needed as a venture capitalist because when the VCs looked at me, they said, wow, he's done uh, this stuff at Intel, then he went out and did these entrepreneurial things, and he knows all the steps involved and what's to be done in terms of investments. So they were much more readily acceptable in terms of giving me the money to go do the venture capital. 
And uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to really uh, get this far the way I wanted to get. So, so you have not been scared of taking risks and that has led to an even more fulfilling career. Absolutely. I do encourage people to always take risks. I mean, what is the downside of taking risks? You know, for me, I did, I must say that it wasn't like I was totally speculative and uh, blinded. Uh, by the time I was leaving Intel, having done Pentium, I had made reasonable uh, financial success for myself as well. As you know, these companies in Silicon Valley and now, of course, uh, in India also, were very, very generous in uh, what's called stock options. So not only were given a good salary and a bonus at the end of the year, but uh, by making the company stock go up, uh, and I remember with 386, 46 and Pentium, the management had become quite used to the fact that every year we'll uh, double the company's uh, stock and split it and then double it and split it and double it and split it like that. I think uh, Intel stock went up, I think, 20,000 times since its uh, uh, start, but we were quite instrumental in raising its own value and becoming part of the uh, benefit came to us itself in terms of the money we made. So it was not a totally blind risk, so I had... Uh, felt that I had taken made enough money that if I'd step out and do something stupid, uh, at least, you know, my family won't suffer and we will not be uh, uh, wondering about how to put food on the table. So that much uh, security was there when I went out to take this leap into the world of uh, startups. And what insight did you gain from your entrepreneurial career and what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs? Yeah, I, I think... Uh, let me uh, give you a, a thoughtful answer on that. Just give me one second. So for the entrepreneurs, okay. So there are a whole bunch of things I would really like to share with them based on my experience. First and foremost, there is no surefire playbook that contains the winning game plan. It's not like, you know, you can go read a book or know a formula that if I did A, B, C, and D, that I will succeed. I, I haven't yet seen one, and I don't think there exists one. Now, there are certain uh, guidelines I will offer based on my own experience, uh, such as, hey, one of the prerequisites is you need to uh, have a strong, experienced team on board. Uh, without that, you really can't build the company. No matter how smart you are, you need to have team, but the team needs to be experienced. That is, not should not be just new college graduates coming out of school and joining you because they themselves are learning. These are people who have already learned somewhere else, and they are coming in to directly apply their learning because the time period is very short in the lifespan of a startup. They have a very small amount of money. They have to survive with that money. You cannot just take forever to build the company. So you need to have good expertise in order to move forward with speed. Your idea needs to be differentiated. It needs to be unique. It needs to be something, like I tell people, it needs to be a, a painkiller. It cannot be a vitamin. You know, vitamin is something sometimes uh, you don't need. A lot of people will say, fine, I forget. I, I, if I don't have money, I'm not going to buy it. But a painkiller is something you cannot live without. So your idea has to be killing some unique pain, and it needs to be differentiated. And, and I think it also should be an idea that really addresses a huge market, because there is a saying that if you want to catch fish, either you need to be a very, very good fisherman, so you uh, know how to throw uh, and catch the fish uh, in a very accurate way, or you can simply stand in a water which has billions of fish uh, around you and just throw your uh, net and collect them. And I, I would rather be the second one. I don't want to be the first one. It's very really hard to be standing alone and trying to catch, you know, out of 10 fish, one fish. I want to be where there are billion fish. So if I throw my net, at least I can get few of them. So that is one of the prerequisites I think people should think about when they want to do a startup. And... Your goal should be not just to create a product or service that your customers will use or want. Your goal should be 
you create a product or service that the customers really want to uh, uh, fall in love with. You know, for example, uh, iPhone uh, and Steve Jobs created iPhone. I, I knew people had fallen in love with it because even the time that he created it, there was a ma major financial crisis here in uh, America, and nobody was going to the malls. People were not shopping. They were depressed. They thought the, the world is coming to an end. And I will go to the mall, and the only shop outside of which I'll see a mile-long line of people patiently waiting to get inside is the Apple store. And that gave me a very clear idea. Not only people love what he made, but now is the time to go buy Apple stock, which was about 15 years ago. It hasn't done bad for me. But, you know, I, I'm glad that I had that uh, observation and I connected the dots to say that if people really love this product so much, this must go on for a long period of time and it has. Now, the other thing that uh, a startup entrepreneur should really think about is it takes a long time for these companies to evolve sometimes. And you have to practically work round the clock. Since it's your own company, you basically are working all the time. And despite doing all that, success is not guaranteed. Like I said, you know, uh, at best, one out of 10 companies succeed, which is like break even. Uh, and if you break even, you really don't make that much money. So before you jump into becoming an entrepreneur for a startup, I please would like you to uh, spend some time introspecting and discovering uh, if this is what you really want to do, knowing, you know, what is entailed in doing that. Uh, as I also observed that many first-time entrepreneurs try to do too many things. For example, if they were succeeding in one area, they suddenly started to go all over the country or all over the world. And in doing so, sometimes they lost, the, got distracted and lost focus and actually ended up not being as successful as they could have been. So it's crucial when you're building a startup to focus and then build it step by step. The other thing I saw as a venture capitalist, a uh, lot of entrepreneurs make a big mistake was when they get funded, they suddenly feel very rich and they go out and start getting computers and renting places and hiring people and really almost taking an eye off of their uh, cash. Remember, cash is king. Uh, cash is the oxygen that fuels your innovation. So you need to really work in a lean manner. Uh, if, you, if you don't do that, then the chances are you're going to run out of money before your plane is ready to take off. So you will just not be successful. And the other thing I would say is you need to be patient and persistent, uh, resilient. You need to be flexible. Uh, you will encounter every known and unknown hurdle along the way uh, of building a startup. It's really not... Uh, 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 a cakewalk. It's a very difficult, difficult thing to do. Uh, you know, entrepreneurship is a real, in my mind, is a real ultimate test of grit and perseverance. Building a startup is like building an aircraft while flying it. Just imagine that. Chaotic and uncertain. It tests your ultimate metal. Uh, the ride is thrilling, but very stressful at times. However, if you, success comes, it's also very rewarding. Yes, sir. I hope the audience watching us as well as budding entrepreneurs can make use of your wonderful tips. Sure. And over the last few years, you have transitioned into a venture capitalist. What pushed you towards making that change? Um, just give me one second. Just give me a second. I'm stepping out for a second. Yes. So, you know, my foray into venture capital was driven primarily by my desire to repay India for giving me an opportunity for good education 
that set the foundation for everything that followed. So having received my undergraduate degree from Delhi College of Engineering, as you said, and I recall, I think the fee at that time was barely in today's dollar, just about $2 per month. So all this time having done Intel and having done Pentium and having done NextGen and Silicon Spice, uh, I was really itching to uh, see what I could do for my own country. And I recall talking to a host of people, both in India and here, and finally concluding that one of the things I could do was to help start, uh, create Silicon Valley style startup successes in India. Uh, and my, my feeling was that if we are able to show to our young boys and girls that they can succeed in Bangalore, Hyderabad, Bombay, Delhi, Hyderabad, and, and, and other big cities the way we are doing here in Silicon Valley, uh, it will start a new wave of uh, startups and venture capital, and uh, it will create new successes and innovation and job opportunities for the youth, uh, for our youth. So this was really the main uh, reason uh, behind uh, transition to venture capital. So I raised a couple of hundred million dollars here from investors uh, who were very willing to invest because they had made enormous amount of money uh, through the sale of Silicon Spice to Broadcom for a billion dollar, for example. They had invested into my company for $1 to $2 price, and they had sold the stock at $170 to $180 surprise, in some cases $230 surprise. So they were quite happy to let some of the money they had made be uh, given to me and also help me raise the funding for this one uh, important cause that I shared with them very much upfront, that I'm not a finance guy, I don't have an MBA degree. I don't have any particular uh, idea of return on investments or how venture capital works, but I have this uh, passion to help India. And this is one way that I've decided to help. And they were luckily uh, willing to join and support me in that cause. So I started a, and founded a uh, fund called Indo-US Venture Capital. And this was the early stage cross-border fund. And we were among us a handful of early pioneers. I think there were five companies including mine, that set up around 2005-2006 uh, venture capital funds in India to invest into companies out of which companies like Flipkart and Mintra and Snapdeal and so many other names came. Yes, sir. Giving back to India must have been very rewarding for you. Yes, very rewarding and still is. <laughs> I mean, I still have great affinity for India and uh, love for it and I've been working behind the scene with the government of India on what should be done in terms of setting up fab or what should be done in terms of creating an ecosystem for design of chips and intellectual property and things of that nature that uh, uh, Professor Patel was discussing prior to this meeting uh, uh, offline. Yes, sir. And you have invested in several Indian startups. So what do you think the future will look like for Indian startups and what, according to you, are the most promising sectors in terms of innovation? So, you know, I, I mean, so let's just step back. Uh, what, what's happened uh, over the last 50 years, and we talked about Moore's Law and how the cost went down and the performance went up and the computing has become uh, uh, ubiquitous. It's available uh, on your phone, in your pocket. You don't even realize that your phone in your pocket is a million times more powerful than the original Pentium chip that I, I, I developed. So this is how much the power of that thing that you carry in your purse or your pocket is. All of this work that has uh, happened in the last 50 years has set the stage, in my opinion, for the next... 30 to 50 years of applying this uh, technology for advancement and enhancement of human life in practically every sphere of our existence. Not just in IT, but in energy, agriculture, healthcare, financials, homes, transportation, all of these sectors in the uh, industry are ripe for transformation. I see a new breed of early stage startups uh, coming up in India 
for AI and machine learning and building these advanced chips that I talked about a few minutes ago. And I also see a host of companies uh, going into fintech and health technology in the last few years. So uh, the startups in uh, uh, India are beginning to go in uh, this direction. But I'm particularly pleased that there is a new wave of Indian startups that's beginning to start, and I hope it really picks up a lot of momentum over a period of time. And they are trying to address the unique needs of our domestic Indian market. To me, that's very crucial and uh, uh, literally a, a very important thing that needs to happen in India. I think some of the noteworthy startups that I am aware of in this area, for example, there's a company called Address Health. Uh, this is in Bangalore. They are focusing on providing healthcare uh, in schools in Bangalore. There's a company called Myra. is an online pharmacy and delivers uh, your critical needs of medicine to your home. It's uh, located in Gurgaon. There's a company called Digi Insurance. Insurance. This is a Bangalore-based startup that, in a very transparent and user-friendly way, insures your cars, mobile devices, travel, jewelry, whatever you need. And uh, I also like this one company called Dr. Insta, which is literally a carbon copy of a American company here that took off in a big way during COVID. It's called Teledoc, where you can uh, consult with your physicians uh, online sitting at your home. So these are new types of companies that are coming up uh, on startup scene in India that are exciting for me. I'm sure the Indian startup industry Yes, me and a host of other people uh, who have really helped uh, in this process, I must say. Uh, engineers today in India are failing to bridge the wide gap between the academic curriculum and industry requirements. So what do you think students should do at an individual level to bridge this gap? So, you know, this question uh, intrigues me. Uh, I'm not... Uh, uh, fully sure that I understand this question completely, but here is my take uh, based on my personal experience. You know, institutes like BJIT or Delhi College of Engineering or Pilani or IITs, they're all good in providing, uh, if I look back to my own career and my life, in providing a solid foundation, uh, initial foundation, by exposing us to a variety of subjects and more especially a grilling experience over five, four or five year period wherein we get the basics to be able to build upon it in later years for the rest of our lives. And what I mean by that is, for example, all of my career is built in semiconductors. But in Delhi College of Engineering, I'm a graduate of 1971. I joined it in 1966 at the age of 16. It was a five year college back then. There was only one chapter in one book in the final year that even talked about FETs, field effect transistors, which is a close uh, analogy to uh, MOSFETs or semiconductor devices. And if you slept through your class in that particular chapter, it means you never learned anything about semiconductors. <laughs> so this is how little, uh, in a relevant way, I was taught. However, what I was taught was invaluable. What I was taught was how to teach myself for the rest of my life. I've been teaching myself all my life, even to date, all of this AI and machine learning. I actually started and co-founded a company in, uh, for a chip company in Bangalore uh, doing exactly AI and uh, machine learning. And it was a totally new field to me. And for over a two-year period, I immersed myself by taking online courses from MIT, uh, courses from uh, uh, even IITs. You know, by the way, all these courses are available online, free, if you guys don't know that. I sat in my home. I took these courses. I learned everything about convolutional neural networks and how to program them, how to build them, how exactly to bias them, and everything around them. And I made myself a semi-expert good enough that I know now what is important in this field and where should I invest my money in, where should I invest my time in, and how should I go about it. So really, I don't necessarily see that gap that uh, the, the students have raised. In fact, I will tell you, I met Sundar Panchaya the other day, and he told me 
when uh, and i said do you know do you know who i am he said of course i know who you are because i wanted to be a semiconductor engineer and his background by the way he has a iit kharagpur degree in metallurgy and then he came to stanford to do material science and he worked even in applied material which is a company that makes all the semiconductor equipment it was his luck and destiny that he went into google and did some software work there and went on now he's of course the ceo of the company and we are very very proud of having a, one of our own in such powerful position but if you look at his background and where he is there is not there is a gap there so i'm not necessarily concerned about this initial gap that somebody has talked about as long as you find your passion and then get more skills to uh, enhance your passion and become expert in that area then that bridging of the gap will sustain you in for a long term success Yes, sir. That is a very unique perspective, and I hope students make use of this online resources. Our audience is primarily soon to be engineers. So, what advice would you give them in these challenging times? Uh, and I'm, when you say challenging time, I'm, I'm assuming you mean COVID caused challenging yes. times, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. You know. I, yeah. I, I think I, I understood that, but I wanted to uh, be clear about it. I think these times. will turn out to be just a blip on the radar of your long span of life i don't think we should really spend too much time uh worrying about them even though they look like everything to us in today's span short span and uh, they are of course you know i don't want to uh undermine the fact they're taking lives it's very sad people are losing jobs in this creating havoc but you know your long your span of life is what people born now and you guys are graduating you are 20 year old you will live till about 100 and if you're living till 100 for 80 years when you are 30 years from now you'll forget what covid was so don't worry too much about it just keep yourself safe wear your mask keep a 6 feet distance and uh, you know wash your hands and if you do these three things which is what i've been doing i think you will have 90% plus chance that you will uh, stay safe but at least that's a non doctor's unofficial opinion okay so whatever worth it is an engineer's opinion counts more than doctors remember that now you should be preparing yourself for the future that's waiting for you to be transformed uh, we have given you amazing technology tools over the last 50 years you should use these tools to really transform the world that is coming in front of us First and foremost I would encourage that each one of you should take charge of your own destiny. You know a lot of people say oh I couldn't do this because this guy did this to me or my boss did not give me a promotion or this person did not give me a raise or you know they whatever happened to them they always point to someone else outside of themselves. I think when it comes to your career you must take charge of your own career no one else but you. and that's the only, if there's only one thing you want to remember that i'm telling you please remember that that you are the master of your destiny you need to take charge of it and discover what excites you and then pick a problem to solve from this vast array of troubles that are inflicting the mankind today poverty inequality race misinformation medical cures for cancer parkinson alzheimer diabetes education i mean just pick anything there are problems and troubles everywhere pick whatever is your passion and then really start building skills and expertise in that area and then go solve that and i think i bet you in any serious way you will solve any of these problems lies at the end of the rainbow a great success both financial and otherwise for the mankind now they've been amazing advances also we didn't talk about we talked about technology only uh, computing technology but not genetics to me one of the most amazing advances that have taken place in the last few decades are in the area of uh, genome editing uh, and uh, exploring ways of potentially removing disease from our dna i mean this is just mind boggling this is the first time that humans are able to edit humans so far we thought god made us and it made us in the way we are all there but if humans are able to go inside of the body and know from that 
programming code, how to do uh, a, a little bit of uh, bits and bytes and program it with the right types of unbuggy bits and bytes, that will be just a mind-boggling change. And it's already happening, by the way. It's not something I'm talking about that's futuristic. It is happening, and it's only slowed down because there's a lot of regulations that need to be addressed before uh, people can uh, freely start going about uh, addressing it. But this kind of world will uh, create uh, a world free of serious chronic illnesses where the plants will be re-engineered to benefit mankind. Some radically new ways will be uh, brought about so we can breathe clean air and put this fossil fuel things behind us. So you, dear students of EJIT, you are at the cusp of this exciting new world, and I will encourage you to go make your own dent in this universe. Thank you, sir. So we are honored by your presence. It was indeed an impactful session. Thank you. Also, thank you to our wonderful audience for tuning in. We hope you all enjoyed the session. I am Murvi okay. Ranjan, and until next time, this is Technovanza VJTI. Thank you very much and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to the student today. Bye-bye.